All right, um, two, so we will get started. Uh, reminder that Friday, test two, you'll have from 12 a.m. to 12 p.m. or you know, 24 hours to take this exam. And let's see, uh, Proctor U, so it's gonna be like, like we did for test one. Look for the material in the test two folder, like normal. Um, the layout and length of test two, it's gonna be very similar to what you had for test one. So nothing, nothing too different from what I gave in test one. So just so you're aware of that. Um, Depending on how we do today, uh, we might have time to answer some general questions or specific questions rather about the test material. But at the very beginning here, um, is there general questions about the test that I can answer for you? Um, if not, you can always just email me too if you do come up with questions. Um, today's material won't be on the test. Uh, test two, that is. Today's material is for test three. All right, so let's jump into it. So our previous lectures, we've been looking at the protein myoglobin and hemoglobin and understanding how they function in the body. And these are um, molecules that can bind to oxygen and hemoglobin will carry oxygen around for you. So that was our example of a protein that carries around a ligand. What we're gonna look at now are two proteins that are responsible for moving your muscles. That's myosin and actin. So we're gonna be talking about muscle proteins today. So let's just start with a zoomed out view and then we're gonna zoom into the actual proteins themselves. So when you look at muscles, they're actually very long cells that are multinucleated. Um, what that means is that when they go through cellular division, they don't actually uh, break apart. They just stay as one very long cell with a bunch of nuclei in them. So that's what multinucleated means. And we call this type of cell a myofibrial, myofibrial. Um, and it runs the whole length of your muscle, just this one long cell. Now, when we look at the muscle cell, the myofibrial, what we'll see is that it's striated, that it has alternating um, areas on the cell. And we say that they're alternating between an A band and an I band. So let's take a look at that. And that's what's being shown down in this picture right here. We are looking at what is called a sacromere. And a sacromere is just like a unit of length in the muscle cell. And it runs from what's called an I band to an I band, right? So your muscle cells have more or less two different areas. They have a darker colored area called the A band and a lighter colored area called the I band. And let me just close my window so you guys don't hear cars the whole time. All right, so we have the darker A band and the lighter colored I band. And in the middle of these bands, we have what are called discs. So on the I band, you have the Z disc. On the A band, you have the M disc. 
And on these discs are where you have proteins more or less attaching to themselves. So in A band, we have what are called thick filaments, also known as, um, well, we'll get to that in a second. So you have thick filaments and on the I band, you have thin filament. So might as well just write it down since I said myosin is going to be our thick filaments. That's a protein we're going to look at. In our thin filaments, that's a protein named actin. So we're, what we're going to be looking at today is how the proteins myosin and actin interact with each other to make your muscles move. So the first question here is that our muscles, like I said, it's just one really long cell that runs the length of your muscle. And they do undergo mitosis, but not the cytokinesis. That's where you have your cells actually breaking into individual cells. Um, so let's imagine that we did have an organism that did have cytokinesis. Why would this be less effective? Well, so if we think about it, we have our muscles are just sacromere lined up the different sacromere. You have I bands, I bands, right? They're all lined up nice and neat. If your, your muscle cells were individual cells, they would also have to be lined up. And you can imagine a world where they don't line up like 100%. So like I'm just drawing individual cells and it probably would not be this bad, but let's say this is, these are like our I bands where they're supposed to be lined up. It's probably a lot harder to line up all your I bands and in individual cells where, sorry, I cannot draw straight lines for the life of me where in a long multinucleated cell, I mean, it's super easy to line them up. So why, why, are, why would a muscle be less efficient if you did do cytokinesis? It's harder to line up these I bands and these I bands and A bands are really, is what, causing the, what is causing the muscle to work. So when they're not lined up, you just get less force. And we're gonna look at how we generate force here using our thick and thin filaments, but this long multinucleated cell allows all these bands to be lined up so we can mac maximize our force. So let's look at our thick filament now, which is called myosin. So the picture on the left is um, a cartoon representation of myosin, that's what that's called. Um, hopefully, after talking about our secondary structures a couple of weeks back, that image looks you know, not 100% foreign to you now. You can see we have a lot of um, alpha helixes, right? Remember that's a ribbon. And you have some loops here where, where it's not in a ribbon. Down here is an artist's representation of this protein. So this protein is really like one of these. And by one, I mean like it's either the blue one or it's the red one. Because for myosin, myosin is made out of six different um, polypeptide chains. It's made out of six different N to C termini chains or six different proteins. You have two what are called heavy chains, and they're called heavy chains because they're way bigger, so they're heavier. Um, so here the blue in this peach color are your heavy chains. And you see you have like a head and tail region as well. The heads are where the N termini are, and the tails are where the C termini are. And these heavy chains just wrap around each other. And you also have light chains, two pairs of light chains, which means in total four light chains. So that's where we're getting our uh, six polypeptides from, two heavy chains and four light chains. And 
you need light chains. They have some regulatory purpose that we're not really going to get into all that much, but they are essential for myosin to work. All right. Now, in the muscle, how do these make a filament? Well, so this what happens is that in the C termini, the C termini of different myosins kind of interact at at the uh, A band and they aggregate. So all of these little head groups that are poking out, that is these. That's what those head groups represent. So a bunch of myosins will aggregate together and form a filament. Where there's only C termini tails, so only C termini, we call that the bare zone. And we're going to talk about the function of how the muscles work, but without a head group, um, your muscles wouldn't do anything. So that's kind of why it's called the bare zone. It doesn't have the part of the protein it needs to move. Um, and then throughout the muscle, throughout this thick filament, you have these head groups uh, pointing, pointing outwards. Um, to go over something that I kind of skipped over. Uh, so here I'm saying the C-terminal is a large uh, helical tail. So you can see they wrap around each other. And the amino acids that make up this tail, we're calling that a pseudo-repeat, um, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, where these just represent any like amino acid. So A here doesn't mean alanine. It's just a, a specific amino acid. And what we find when we look at myosin is that in the A and D positions, these amino acids are nonpolar. That is what is causing this wrapping. Wherever the two C termini tails interact, an A or a D is going to be there. So the reason why these termini interact is the hydrophobic effect. Water pushes these tails together so the hydrophobic residues are hiding and they will wrap around each other to make sure that the hydrophobic amino acids at position A and D are always in contact with each other, that they don't have to contact the water. So that is the general structure of myosin, uh, one, of the, uh, amine, uh, one of the proteins that make up your muscle and it's a protein that makes up the thick filament. So before I move on here, um, are there any questions about any information um, that I went over so far? All right, if not, um, we can move on. So just have another like review question here. Um, is myosin a globular or fibrous, fibrous protein? And if we look at myoglobin, you can see that we have this head group here, but we also have this long tail. And so when we think of it as a class, we would actually say it's both. Right, and it's actually shown very well on the previous image, um, previous slide as well. Um, the head groups are would be globular, while the tails are definitely fibrous. And myosin has both of these because it wants to do both functions. So the uh, fibrous portion of the protein is really there for structural purposes for the structure of the muscles. And the globular part of the protein, that's where the chemistry actually happens for our muscle movement. So it has both, both types of proteins. It's both a, a, a fibrous and globular proteins because it, it uses both of those proteins to do its function, right? The globular part to do the biochemistry, the fibrous part because it needs to be long 
and it's part of how we can have movement within the muscle. So the simple answer to that question is both. So we looked at one protein, the thick filament, myosin. Let's look at the thin filament and it's made out of the protein called actin. Now actin is um, not just in your muscles. Actin is actually the most abundant protein you have in the cytosol of your cells. And eukaryotic cytosol is the most abundant protein. So actin is a structural protein um, it's used for a lot of different purposes. Here, we are just looking at it in terms of muscle cells, but just be aware it is used in a lot of different types of cells as well. And you have two different forms of actin. You have a monomeric form, which is called G-actin, or you have a polymer form called F-actin. Now, there seems to be a confusion with this um, every time I talk about actin. When I talk about G-actin and F-actin, it's the same protein. G-actin and F-actin aren't like different proteins. They're 100% they're the same thing. The only difference is, is that globular, so this I'm drawing like G-actin, Globular actin, G actin, is just in a monomer form, but these actins can actually come together and interact to make a fiber. That's called F actin. And these two can switch. You can either be in the globular form where you're all alone, or you can be with your buddies in F actin. Now, actin has uh, binding sites for three different ligands, ATP, calcium, and magnesium. And when it's in the monomer form, it's gonna have ATP bound. After it becomes F-actin, after a little while, that ATP will hydrolyze to form ADP. Right? And that's what the magnesium is gonna be doing for the most part. Um, especially if you take biochemistry too, we'll talk about this quite a bit, but magnesium interacts very well with negatively charged biomolecules. So your DNA is just covered in magnesium. Um, and whenever you break phosphates from ATP, there's gonna be a magnesium ion there or some other divalent cation there. And divalent cation, in case you aren't sure what that word means. Divalent, charge of two, cation, positive. So when breaking ATP, you need some kind of divalent cation to help balance the charges. Magnesium is usually the ion that does that. And so here, that's what it's most likely doing in actin. And so G-actins come together and they hydrolyze their ATP. And F-actin is kind of like DNA in that it is a double helix. And each subunit of this helix contains four actin molecules. That's kind of what we're trying to show here. And we actually have, what, one, two, three, four, five. So here we are trying to show the four different actins and this brown one is the continuation of the fiber, right? So you have purple, teal, goldish, bluish, not too great my colors, but that would make up like one, one subunit or one structure. And then this, this just repeats. It's just four, 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 four. And they wrap around each other to make the helix. So you can kind of, these little bulbs are like actin poking out. You can kind of see like a double helix happening here. I guess it's better if I use a white pen instead of a black pen. So kind of wrapping around and this one's wrapping around like that, just like DNA structure. 
Now, fibrous actin, um, each end is not the same. Uh, the ends are different and they have a polarity. You have the minus end and your plus end. And they will bind so that, you know, one subunit. So if I draw some subunit right here, it has a plus end and a minus end. They're going to line up so it's plus the minus and plus the minus. Like that. And these plus and minus ends, they have to do with like where actin is going to add and where actin is going to come off. But we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute, um, this idea of how to make strands. So that'll be like our very last slide here. But it's this F actin we really care about. Um, in the muscle, that F actin is going to be there. You're, you're not going to have the G actin as much. The G actin is more um, inside your cytoplasm. So for just our purposes of how do muscles work on a protein level, what we're going to be caring about is the F actin. That's going to be doing the biochemistry with myosin. All right, so before I move on, um, any questions about the information presented um, on this slide? All right, we can move on then. So question three is just a review question for when you are studying for test three. Uh, just make sure you have that. Just what is the muscle? Um, what is anchoring on each of the muscles? So if we just go back, Z disc and M disc. So here it is. So the M disc, that's going to be your uh, thick filaments, your myosin, all the Z disc is your thin filaments. That's going to be your actin. So, like I said, that question is more for later on when, you know, the day before the test, when you're reviewing the notes again, uh, just to test yourself, like the type of question you might see on test three. But let's actually go and talk about you know, interactions between myosin and actin. And first off, before we talk about what's known as the power stroke, we're going to talk about regulation of muscle movements. So myosin and actin aren't the only two proteins that are responsible for muscle movements or are just in your muscles. Um, you also have other proteins and a lot more proteins than we're, what we're going to talk about. But let's talk about the proteins called tropomyosin and troponin. Um, these are regulation proteins, and they will associate with the thin filament, or also known as actin. So tropomyosin is what's called a homodimer, right? Homo means same, dimer means two. So it's a protein Excuse me, I'm going to sneeze here. All right, so it's a protein that is made that is um, made out of um, like it's kind of hard to say this while saying the word protein again. That's why I was struggling. But like two copies of the same protein come together to make one protein. Um, so that's what a homodimer means. It has two N to C termini, or uh, two peptide chains. That's the word I was looking for. Two peptide chains that come together to make one protein. And those peptide chains are identical to each other, both in structure and in sequence. So that's what a homodimer is. They form what a, what's called a coiled coil. Right, so we, we talked about coil coil before, but what that means is that each um, protein is a coil 
and they coil around each other. So that's what a coiled coil is. And what tropomyosin does is that it forms like a cable, like it says there, and just wraps itself around F-actin. So um, if F-actin, remember it's a double helix, so I'm gonna be drawing it like just as a straight line for ease. So if that's F-actin, what tropomyosin is doing is just kind of wrapping around it. And the reason why it does this is that um, when tropomyosin is wrapped around your F-actin, your muscles can't work. They can't contract, they can't expand. So this is a way to prevent your muscles from just randomly um, activating when you don't want them to, right? Because you want control over your muscles. So if you don't want to use your muscles, like when you're sleeping, you don't want to get a muscle cramp where your muscles just randomly fire off your tropomyosin wraps around your F helix. But along with tropomyosin, there's another protein called troponin. So let me just continue my drawing here. So that's tropomyosin. And you also have troponin, which I'm going to draw with blue. So troponin, troponin. And the way I think about troponin is as a lock, right? So tropomyosin is like a chain, like a bike chain, and troponin is the bike lock. So troponin is what is keeping tropomyosin interacting with actin. It's locking that in place so your tropomyosin doesn't fall off, letting your actin be exposed, right? And troponin, we can bind three different things, calcium, actin, and tropomyosin. So that's why I drew it so that our tropomyosin and our F-actin and our troponin are all at the same location because it has to bind both things. So that's how we're binding um, tropomyosin only when it's on actin. But you can see we also have this calcium binding area. So what happens is that if you want your muscles to move, so if, you, if you're just sitting there right now, like flexing your hand or doing something like that, you're, at, you're doing the process I'm about to describe, right? So when you want your muscles to move, uh, you send a nerve signal. And what this nerve signal does, one of the things it does is that it will release calcium. This calcium does a lot of things, but for us, for what we're talking about right now, calcium, binds troponin. When calcium binds troponin, troponin falls off, no longer interacts with your actin and tropomyosin. It's, it's gone. So well, I didn't want to delete all that, but it, it works. When troponin is gone, as, saw, as seen in my example, giant erasure there, uh, tropomyosin also falls off. And now you have naked actin. Now you have a thin filament with no tropomyosin or troponin on it. So now we're gonna learn about this in the next slide here. Once this is opened, the, the thick filament or myosin so myosin with the head group and the coil. Myosin can now bind onto actin, allowing your muscles to move. So that is how you can use you know, nerve impulses to really control when you want your muscles to move or if like you're sleeping, you don't want your muscles to move. All right, so any questions about tropomyosin, troponin, 
or anything that we have talked about um, up to this point in the class. All right. So here is just a little uh, review question for you. Um, just to keep you engaged a little bit, make sure you're still with me. Um, so I'll give people like a minute and decide on this. I'm not gonna pull up a poll or anything. So um, just feel free to answer yourself. But based on what I just said, what is the best statement of troponin. So take a minute, see if you can uh, figure this one out and I'll be back to uh, explain the answer. All right, so let's take a look at this. A, is it a major component of the thick filament of the myofibrule? No, that is myosin, so it's not that. B, is it a calcium binding protein? Yeah, it can bind uh, calcium. C, is it a functional unit of the myofibrule? No, that's the I band, thick and thin filament, A band, all that. Is it a major component of the thin filament? No, that's actin. Is it a chemical source for muscle contraction? No, that's ATP. So um, troponin, out of all these, all, it's just a calcium binding protein and it's really for regulation purposes, but it's not part of the thin filament, that's actin. It's not part of the thick filament, that's myosin. So the answer for this one is B. All right. Let's get to how your muscles move. And this is called the power stroke. So we're gonna start in the top picture right here. The yellow actin is your thin filament. Then we have our thick filament, which is this light brownish color. Where the Actin is gonna to bind to the thick filament is the myosin head. So the myosin head has areas on it that are attracted to actin. And we're gonna start with um, actin and myosin already being bound. Right, so the first step in the power stroke is that ATP comes in. ATP binds myosin. And once ATP is bound, myosin no longer binds to actin. So that's what's going on in our first step. Our second step, we hydrolyze ATP. So right now we have ADP plus phosphate bound. When that happens, the position of the myosin head moves, it switches a little bit, it cocks forward. This will also cause myosin to rebind to actin, very weak, very weakly. After you are bound to actin again, but in a new position, so that's what that orange is showing you. 
this orange is your frame of reference for where you were bound originally. So you can see we are now at a different area. So next, we release phosphate. And that causes the power stroke. So after the phosphate is released, myosin can go back to its original position, like it will move backwards. However, it is bound to a different actin. So this causes the whole thin filament to be dragged in one direction because this is a lot of myosin heads working in unison, right? So the thin filament is moved one way and the thick filament is moved another way. And that's how you can get a muscle contraction. You're making your muscles contract. Following the power stroke, ADP is released and you restart. Now, I think, a, whoopsies, I think a very good way to show this is by using myself as um, uh, a visual representation of what's going on. So I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. Oops, I wanna do that. All right, so my hands, they're gonna be myosin. And imagine there's a rope above me. That's gonna be my actin. So if I'm gonna be following along, my myosin heads are grabbing onto actin. And so the first step is that ATP comes and binds. Uh, sure, I am bound to ATP, I have stuff in my hands. That causes me to release from my, from my actin. Following that, and I'm guess I'm just going to use the pen from now on because that's the cat. Once I release, my ATP hydrolyzes. So here's my ADP and here's my phosphate. That hydrolyzes. That causes my heads to shoot forward. Once I shoot forward, I'm going to reattach and lose my phosphate. Then I'm going to lose my ADP and go backwards. That is the power stroke. So let me do it again really fast. I'm bound to actin. Eight, and ATP comes. I release. Hydrolyze ATP. Spring forward, then reattach. Lose phosphate. And then lose my eight. So lose phosphate, go back and lose ADP. So attach, release, forward, attach. That's the power stroke. That's how your muscle can contract. So now that you saw that amazing demonstration, and after I threw my pen all across my room, um, any questions about how the power stroke um, actually works or anything at all? Yeah, you release ADP after you're attached, after you, you reattach, right? So you like, you move, you're attached and you move backwards. Sorry, headphone users, I didn't mean to hit my computer. Um, and you, and you re release your ADP. That's correct. Uh, that is, that's the step. Anything else? All right. So here's a question. Um, rigor mortis. So when you die, after a little bit, after a couple hours or so, rick and mortis sets in. Your muscles become extremely stiff and you can't move them anymore. 
why does this happen? What is the molecular basis for this based on what we just talked about? Well, let's, let's think about the, this in terms of the power stroke again, right? So myosin, let's, let's, let's make this simple. There's actin and there's, there's my, and myosin, I'm gonna draw in red, there's myosin. Myosin has two positions. Position one, attached to actin. Position two, uh, not attached to actin. The difference between these two conformations is that you will only, oops, you will only be off of actin if you have ATP around. So once myosin binds ATP, you let go of the thin filament. Now let's think about this in terms of rigor mortis. When you die, you no longer do oxidative phosphorylation because you're not breathing. So the amount of ATP in your cell drops a ton until there's basically none left because you don't remake it. If there's no ATP around, myosin won't be binding this ATP. So myosin will become stuck onto actin. It'll just be hanging on there and there's nothing to make it come off anymore. So that's why you get very stiff muscles. You run on ATP, you can't remove the actin anymore. And so on each of your thin filaments, you just have thousands upon thousands of tiny protein heads hanging on without the molecule around anymore to kick them off. So that in, in a very simple explanation is how rigor mortis works. Questions about that? All right, I believe I have one more slide. I have one slide and a question. So um, looks like we have five minutes left. So I did say if you had any specific questions about the test, I would be willing to put some time aside. So. Does anyone have anything at all they would like to ask about test two? And I don't know the number of questions because I wrote this draft like on the weekend and haven't looked at it since, um, but it should be roughly the same length as test one. That also means I don't know exactly the questions I made but it's all going to be in the test two folder. Do, do, do. do you know how to draw phylogenetic trees? Um, you should be able to know how to read them. If I give you a phylogenetic tree, you should know that things closer on the tree means they're more closely related, evolutionary speaking, and that a branch point means a common ancestor but I will not give you information in a table and ask you to draw a tree. So that's something I might do if I had you in an in-person class, but um, with this being an online class, anything to do with drawing, I'm not doing, so. Any other questions? Anything at all while you have me? Can I explain a Ramachandran plot? Sure can. Let me just draw it here. Okay. So a Ramachandran plot, 
phi psi. To really understand what a Ramachandran plot is, you have to understand what it's measuring. And it's measuring dihedral angles, right? So just a quick overview of what a dihedral angle is again. It's an angle made out of four atoms. You keep the middle two atoms like in line with each other. So imagine like you're here, yay. And you're looking down the middle two atoms. Then you're asking, you now what angle are these two making, right? So on my 2D drawing, you only have two possible angles. This would be an angle of zero or 360. Or the other way I can draw this in two dimensional space. This is an angle of 180. I guess I could draw other ones now that I think about it. This would be an angle of 90, right? Um, kind of, not really actually, but that's that in a nutshell is what a dihedral is. All right, for proteins, the dihedral we care about when it comes to structure are backbone. So you're looking at dihedrals of backbone atoms and backbone atoms, right? So you're looking at this in terms of a peptide. So you're just looking at what are the conformations of dihedral angles made out of backbone atoms in my peptide? And based on these dihedral angles, and phi and psi are just different dihedral angles that we can measure. And what a Raman Chandran plot is really telling you is secondary structure. And it's saying in your protein, if you see um, phi and psi angles that have a measurement up here and the, phi, the Raman Chandran plot is like minus 180 to 180, minus 180 to 180. So you're just taking two dihedral measurements at the same location. And the only thing that's different between these dihedrals is the atoms you're looking at. But basically, if you have a measurement up here, what that tells you is that you have to be in a beta sheet. So beta sheet has a specific combination of phi and psi angles. If you're over here, you're in a, I believe, left-handed alpha helix. If you're over here, you're in a right-handed alpha helix. So that's one thing it tells you. It tells you the phi and psi combinations needed to adopt sec, uh, uh, different types of secondary structure. It also tells you flexibility of specific amino acids, um, but I didn't really go into that all that much. So what we really need to know is Ramachandran plot is fine psi combinations that lead to secondary structure. Fine psi angles are dihedral angles, and they're dihedral angles of backbone atoms. That is basically what a Ramachandran plot is. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so it is 2.50. Um, so I'll call it here. If you have other questions, please don't hesitate to email me and I'll get back to you um, with answers. Otherwise, um, the test will open at, um, you know, basically it opens at 11.59 on Thursday and then closes at 11.59 on Friday, 11.59 p.m. Um, so you have that 24 hour window and uh, yeah, let me know if you have questions. Otherwise, good luck um, and hope you do well. And I will, I will probably have them graded by Monday. That's, that's my plan. We'll see, but that's my plan. And I will see everybody, hopefully, on Monday. Study hard. Have a good one. Take care.